apply for this loan. But alas, on April 16, the notice came out that two programs of the CARES Act were suspended pending additional funding. And those two acts were, uh, those two programs were of course the PPP loan program because all the funds had been committed. And then the EIDL, which is, it, it was uh, up to $2 million loan available at low interest rates for both small businesses and nonprofits. And that's also been currently suspended. So if you're feeling like this whole thing has been really chaotic, it's because it, it is, and it's all occurred in a very condensed timeline. And so um, if we go on to page five here, this is a summary of uh, the various things that have been available under the CARES Act. So the SBA low pro loan programs, we have the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP, which is currently suspended. There's the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, the EIDL, and that has two aspects to it. The one aspect was the ability to apply for a loan of up to $2 million with um, deferred repayment at low interest rates. That has all been appropriated. The other part of that though is the Emergency Economic Injury Grant. And that gives you, uh, it's supposed to be instantaneous and automatic $10,000 um, assistance that is not, you don't need to repay. And I believe, and Grant can correct me because he's monitoring this by the minute, but I believe that's still available. Um, so we want to make sure you're aware of that. Yeah, we've gotten, there's been, if you've applied for one of those, there's been some interesting guidance that's been sent out by the SBA saying um, that they're limiting the, you know, it's in the CARES Act, it says it's going to be up to $2 million. And apparently they're so short on funds that they've been sending out messages saying that they're limiting that to $15,000 per taxpayer, which is a huge adjustment, and that they've created a separate threshold of $1,000 per employee for the loan forgiveness. So it's a lot smaller. We'll, like Debbie said, we'll spend more time on the Paycheck Protection Program loans, but know that if you've been hearing things that seem kind of shocking and haven't been a part of the, anything you've read in the CARES Act, um, that's been part of the guidance that's been issued by the SBA and that is accurate and up to date. Yeah. So there are um, also some things available through the state. Uh, one of those things is the express bridge loan. And then also as part of the CARES Act, there's the employee retention credit so that, you know, within guidelines, you get to take a $5,000 credit per employee. And then there's the payroll de uh, tax deferral. And I believe everyone is eligible for that. And what that is, um, is that you can suspend the employer portion of the social security, um, the FICA insurance. So you would still need to submit or, uh, with every pay period, you'd need to go ahead and remit the employee portion of that tax, but you can defer submitting the employer portion. It's not a, forgive, a forgiven loan or anything like that, but it might help with cash flow. And so there are, there are other things available. We just want you to know that. And then um, to a much lesser degree, I think for this audience is uh, there's also four loan programs that are being administered by the Department of Education. So if you're in that education area, um, uh, let's see, a primary school, secondary school, higher education, there's loans available um, for all of those education institutions. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Grant and he will go through some of the nuts and bolts of how the PPP program um, is being handled. And it's probably still important that we go through this because we're all very hopeful that there will be, um, they're talking about another $250 billion to um, add to the PPP loans. 
Um, but maybe first we should pause. And Kristen, are there is there any information on maybe what folks on the call want to make sure that we address? Um, just a couple of things that I think you, you are going to cover. It is around, if you already have the loan, how to stay in compliance for, for loan forgiveness. Oh. And I think everyone's question is, will there really be more money coming in a second round for the PPP? Okay. Thanks. One other program that's available as well, I'm not as familiar with it. It's state run. It's not a part of the CARES Act, but there's also a state level uh, grant that's available for businesses. It's very small businesses with up to 10 employees is the maximum. So, but if you're a really small organization, that's another area where you might be able to find some relief. All right, so details on the Paycheck Protection Program. This is probably where you've seen a lot of guidance coming out from different sources, some of it official published sources, some of it has been you know, commentary that you'll read in Forbes or Wall Street Journal. Um, the actual loan itself, most of which is eligible for forgiveness, so it doesn't actually function as a loan long-term, um, is determined by taking two and a half times your average monthly payroll for one year period before the loan application. There's gonna be exceptions to a lot of these rules um, for like seasonal businesses. We just don't have enough time to get into the details of all of those today. Um, Compensations capped at 100K an employee. You can still include employees that are paid over 100K, but you can only include up to $100,000 of their salary or payroll. Um, and then there's a $10 million maximum per entity. I have not heard anything with regard to that maximum being capped the same way that I've heard about the EIDL being capped. Um, in each section, there are separate of the CARES Act, there's separate references to covered periods and those definitions and that term is used for different parts of the calculation. Um, so just be aware if you're working through this um, covered period for purposes of determining what loan you're eligible for is not the same as the covered period for purposes of loan forgiveness. Um, so you gotta keep your pencils sharp um, when you're doing those calculations to make sure you don't miss details like that. Um, this is for businesses of up to 500 employees. There are exceptions to that for certain SBA um, defined industries. Sometimes they will, if you have over 500 employees, you can also still be eligible if you have under a certain amount of revenue. You can find that information online on the SBA website. It only includes compensation for US-based employees, which is probably a significant uh, limitation to note for a lot of the companies that are on today that probably have employees that are working abroad normally. Um, but I think there might also be some complications if you've brought some of those employees back to the US and how that gets treated. Um, it includes affiliate, affiliate organizations for determining whether you're over that 500 employee exemption or a requirement threshold. There, the affiliate rules are pretty specific and there's a lot of examples. It is based on a power and control um, methodology. Um, that's all available in the federal SBA guidelines um, if you're interested in determining whether your organization qualifies based on ownership. Um, only, so all or a portion of the loan is forgivable. We'll talk more um, about that calculation in a moment. One thing that's not clear in the CARES Act, but has been clarified by the SBA in subsequent publications is that at least 75% of the forgiven amount has to be used for payroll. So there are other items like mortgage interest, rent, utilities that can be a part of that forgiveness calculation, 
but 75% of it has to be payroll. And then for the, to the extent that you don't receive full loan forgiveness, there's a 1% interest rate on the remaining loan after a six month deferral period. Um, and then after that six months is over, it's a two year maturity date for the loan. And then there are also other restrictions. So if you take advantage of the payroll protection program loan, that in itself can limit your ability to take advantage of other incentives that are a part of the CARES Act. And if you receive forgiveness, that also can limit your ability. Um, so you gotta make sure you're reading the fine print, considering what your benefits might be under some of these other um, programs, especially now I think that it's a little bit uncertain about the future of this program and how many more, how much more funding is gonna be made available and how quickly that's gonna go. Um, and again, any business concern or nonprofit organizations, um, Section 501c3s um, exempt from taxation under 501a, that employees not more than 500 people is eligible for this. With regard to the EIDL, um, which we're not going to go into a lot of detail today because we just don't have enough time to do that. Um, that 500 employee limit does not apply to private nonprofits. Um, mm -hmm. So that's another, that might bring some additional listeners from the call today um, within the uh, realm of relief. So how to apply, um, well, as, we said before, the funds have been fully allocated. However, guidance from the SBA has said that you should still continue working with your bankers to process your applications because if there is more funding that's provided, we wanna make sure um, that you're in the queue already. Um, so that's important. There's a list of approved lenders, the EIDL loans, which I think people historically are more familiar with, you apply for those online directly with the SBA. For the payroll protection loans, you apply with SBA approved lenders. And there's a list of them. If you click on this link, which we'll send out after the presentation, um, there's a link here, which will take you directly to the SBA site and you'll be able to find out who the approved lenders are. There's a lot of them have imposed restrictions on who they'll accept applications for. So I know like Bank of America, for instance, you have to have an existing line of credit and I think online banking set up um, if you want to apply for a loan with them. So you'll have to check with each individual institution to find out what restrictions there might be with regard to application. I know that that has frustrated a lot of banking clients that thought that they would have been able to work with their normal financial institution and to process these loans, haven't been able to, and then they don't know where to go next. Um, obviously, getting this process as quickly as possible is really important when the funds are going very quickly. So if you're thinking of applying or you're already somewhere in the application process, here's a list of materials that you'd want to have ready. Payroll reports, um, different uh, federal forms that you filed that will be requested, um, corporate bylaws, IRS determination letters related to your entity. Um, and there is Another great link here, which I'll share. And again, very detailed information here that the SBA has published regarding the application process step-by-step -step, um, that you can find online. And again, that we'll provide links for um, via this posted slide deck afterwards. So here is an example of loan calculation. It's not 
the most simple formula, but um, so it's probably worth looking for an online resource. This one above is from Lane Powell. There are a lot of Excel spreadsheets out there that will help you do this. So you're not having to design this calculation on your own um, because while it is not incredibly complex, there are some areas where it would be easy to make a footfall in your calculation. Um, there's also an interactive loan calculator available on the SBA website that um, will be included at this link here. So what are your eligible costs? Um, this is for not only how you're, what funds you're able to, um, you, what expenses you're able to spend the funds that you receive on, um, but also what is going to go into the forgiveness calculation, which we're still, as we go through this, you're probably gonna be thinking about your own organization and fact pattern. And I've heard so many different hypotheticals which create problems for some of these in uh, when these rules are applied to them. A lot of them relate to timing of um, different employees that are seasonal or rehiring employees that you um, had previously laid off. In some cases, you're gonna find that perhaps employees that you've laid off that are receiving unemployment benefits now, if you were to rehire them so that you would be expending payroll amounts in order to qualify for forgiveness, that they might actually be, if you reduce their payroll to some extent, they might be receiving more benefits under unemployment than they would be if you brought them back on. So there's a lot of different calculative considerations to take into account here and also perhaps political ones. Um, so payroll costs are included as eligible costs. Um, these include healthcare benefits, um, employee salaries, commission, other similar compensation. When you read the CARES Act, it says payments to independent subcontractors are included. There's been subsequent guidance from the SBA that limits the ability that you have to include those payments because more than likely those independent contractors may also be eligible themselves as sole proprietors for their own loan. So they wanna avoid a situation where you're double counting payroll. Um, again, I think the most important thing here is that it's gotta be, the payroll costs have to be 75% of the amount that is forgiven. Um, and then here are a few other items that can make up that remaining 25%. Um, and the amount forgiven is going to be the covered period for purposes of this forgiveness is the eight week period following the date that you receive the loan proceeds. Um, so again, interest payments on mortgage obligations, rent, utilities, those are all eligible expenses as well. Um, it's gonna be important to keep good documentation on this. Um, and that's gonna be easier for some businesses than it will be for others. Um, but really important when it comes to making sure that you get the forgiveness that you're entitled to. Here are a few items that we've listed as examples of documentation that you'd wanna keep on file. Limits, I mean, I've read quite a few articles talking about how these formulas can be misrepresented or manipulated in order to increase loan forgiveness or how it could adversely affect taxpayers that are in different scenarios where they're trying to rehire employees at different points during their covered period. But here is an overview of what the formulas entail. I think the important thing to take away from this is that if you're reducing the number of employees that you have, or you're reducing the salaries and wages that you pay them um, beyond 25%, 
then you're going to be subject to certain limitations on the amount of forgiveness that you're eligible for. Um, these rules are a little bit complex with regard to the number of employees calculation because you can have two different denominators here. Um, and there is some debate about how you would define a full-time employee as well. Um, so we're expecting more guidance from the SBA on this, but it really will require digging into the rules um, to figure out how the way they're drafted now is going to affect your business. Um, if you're hiring, if you're losing any employees, if you're rehiring any of them, or if you're reducing their salary beyond 25%. Um, here's an example of the, the forgiveness calculation. I think the important thing to highlight here is that it's more complex than the calculation for determining your loan proceeds. Um, so this is probably where you're going to spend most of your time um, figuring out what's going to be forgiven versus how much of a loan you're actually going to get. And Grant, um, I just wanted to add that that uh, calculation is also from Lane Powell. So we'll make sure to uh, add that on the slide before we send these out. Yeah. Great. So I think, Debbie, you have some suggestions on, you know, from a practical perspective, how do I keep everything organized and how do I prepare <laughs> myself to when it does come time to calculate loan forgiveness and document that? What are yeah. best practices? Yes, absolutely. So for the past couple of weeks, you know, all the attention and, and questions have been on what is a PPP loan and how do I get one? And now some organizations that have actually gotten one are now calling and saying, how do I need to account for this? What do I need to keep track of? And so we have some suggestions here. And the first one, um, you know, understanding that what you can use the funds for. And, um, you know, Grant just went through a list of what are the eligible costs and really understanding that will be important. And probably one of the most important things is to have a, either a good payroll system or a really good payroll provider. So your payroll providers are also scrambling, trying to make sure that they understand all these rules and that they're able to accurately track things. So one thing Clark Newber does is, um, this is not a sales pitch, but we are a reseller for MIP software. Lots of nonprofits use that. And, and we are getting many, many questions about how can I set up the general ledger structure to make sure that I'm able to isolate and track these specific payroll costs that I intend to be able to recover or have forgiven under the loan. So if you are doing your own payroll, um, being able to track those costs that you specifically intend to have forgiven or working with your payroll provider for that. The other thing is, if you are going to take advantage of that um, payroll tax deferral where you can um, not submit the employer portion of the FICA tax, initially at least you get that deferral, then being able uh, to make sure that you're able to track that in your payroll system. And then uh, it's been highly recommended that we've heard um, to have a separate bank account for these funds. And so, you know, uh, when you get your loan proceeds, they'll go into a special account and then you can move funds out of that account as you incur those specific costs that you intend to have forgiven. Um, we've been told by some clients mm -hmm. that some of their banks, when they fund the loan, they're just saying, we are opening a separate account for these funds for you, and this is the, the account we're going to fund. So a separate bank account is probably a good idea. And then retaining and segregating full supporting documents. So that, of course, all your receipts, your payroll reports, your payroll support, your Form 941s that you're submitting for quarterly payroll reporting, 
and also having on uh, available, if you applied for or obtained a PPP loan, you probably should have some sort of board resolution um, because most organizations need some kind of approval or delegation of authority um, to go out and apply for additional funding or take on additional debt. So you should probably have on hand um, your uh, board resolution authorizing you to take on more debt. And then we also recommend to keep monitoring that SBA website because it really is changing all the time. Um, so those are some of the things that we think you'll need um, to maximize your full amount uh, forgiven. And so if we go on, Grant, to the next slide. Okay, so here are some of the things we've heard. So as of yesterday, April 16th, loan applications are no longer being accepted by the SBA. So as Grant mentioned, please continue to keep in touch with your banks and get direction from them on what they're, they're willing and able to keep processing or get queued up. So as of yesterday, we understand that 1.6 million loans have been approved. The full 349 billion has been allocated. Um, they had targeted uh, 5,000 approved lenders and they, they reached the 4,975. Um, in Washington state, 19,000 loans were processed as of April 13, about $5 billion. Um, this shocked me this morning. I read this fact that um, as many loans have been processed in the past 14 days as in the past 14 years by the SBA. So it's just a huge volume of loans. Um, yeah, so. Okay, what we're hoping and what is expected is a second wave of funding totaling $250 billion. Um, but there's currently, they're trying to work that out in the Houses of Congress. We recommend keeping in touch with your bank. And as Kristen said, um, she's keeping in touch with her bank. I know this is totally anecdotal. It, it's just what we have heard, Columbia Bank, if you're working with them, they have been really good about keeping in touch with, with their uh, clients and also the people who have applied. Keep following up on your loan application. And if you haven't yet applied, um, as Grant mentioned, uh, be prepared. I mean, continue with the process. That's what we're recommending. Continue with the process, have all your stuff put together. And so when, when and if there is additional funding, you can just pull the trigger and, um, and move right with that. Um, let's see. Oh, there's lots of comments coming in. Okay, yes. Heidi, hi Heidi. She says, I can confirm Columbia Bank has been amazing. I can confirm too, Columbia Bank um, reached out to us very early in the process and said, Clark Number, you work with a lot of nonprofits. We work with a lot of nonprofits. Why don't we you know, collaborate together, share information? And Columbia Bank was amazing in sharing information with us on where they're at in the process, how they're planning to, to get through all this. Um, let's see, what else? Someone has a comment regarding Bank of America eligibility process. Um, Kristen, do you want to uh, give yeah. access to them? We could, but there's actually some other questions in the Q&A. Why don't we go to that first? Okay. Um, and in duty, if it's a if it's a comment you want just all the participants to hear, you could type in a comment. Or if you want to to ask Debbie and Grant, um, we can we can do that as well. Um, but first, uh, Grant, you mentioned this, I, and I still have this question. There's confusion around the time period of the period for loan forgiveness. Is it until June thirtieth that we're all hearing, or is it the did you say eight week period after you get the loan in your bank? What's, what's the period for loan forgiveness that you're supposed to be tracking? 
For loan forgiveness, it's the eight week period after you receive the loan proceeds. Um, so that's the covered, this is where it gets confusing because you're gonna read about covered period for purposes of determining your loan amount. Um, and that's where you're gonna find that June date. Um, but the, it is the eight week period starting when you receive the funds um, that you're using for loan forgiveness calculations. Where I think this is gonna get kind of interesting, although maybe it won't be as complex as it could be, is if they approve this additional funding um, and people are receiving the funds less than eight weeks before the June 30th date. I think that creates some problems in the way the rule is drafted, but it's probably not worth going into a lot of detail about what that would mean because I think there would have to be additional guidance and some date extensions. Um, but yeah, there are fixed dates with regard to reducing the eligible loan forgiveness with regard to employee number and salary, but then the covered period references that you're gonna see are that eight week period after you get your funds. Okay, no, that, that's helpful. Um, another question that I've heard that's common, uh, should we apply to, to only one bank? I have heard from several um, clients that they applied to multiple banks. I believe in the certification grant, you probably know this off the top of your head. When you apply for that loan, there's a number of things you need to certify. And I believe you're only supposed to apply to one bank. But if, but I know of organizations that applied to a bank, they never heard, they never were contacted back, so they applied to another bank. I know one organization that applied to three banks, and it was finally the third one that they engaged with. Yeah, that's my impression as well. You're not mm -hmm. supposed to go through the formal application, like move forward going through the application process with multiple banks. But from a practical perspective, um, since there have been a lot of lenders that have just not been that responsive, um, I've heard of situations similar to the one that you described, Debbie. Yeah, you can certainly apply. contact more than one bank, but you, but as Grant said, you can't actually have three active applications going on. Yeah, and from my experience, start with your own bank, right? That's where your, your banking relationship is. And if they're approved SBA, start theirs. And, and again, maybe I'm fortunate Again, I have Columbia Bank, which um, also has staff at the bank who are, uh, they're volunteers and on boards of nonprofits. So they actually understand the language a little better, I think, than larger mm -hmm. banks and know what the bylaws are and know how to go through the process with you. Um, speaking of bylaws, uh, can you repeat, Debbie, you said this, uh, your guidance on a board resolution because I know in my bylaws it just says that the board president can authorize uh, taking a loan. Do you recommend having a, a resolution in addition to that? And um, does this, do you know if this also applies to universities? Yes. So um, if whatever, whatever your established policy is, so if you need full board approval to take on new debt, well, then that's what you would need. Kristen, in your case, you know, if an individual is um, authorized to approve that, well, that's all you need. Just follow your, whatever your, um, your established policy is. I, we do recommend documenting everything. So one thing that I'm learning about this CARES Act, it, it seems like everywhere I look, there's a different aspect of this. So I'm not sure if anyone on the call now gets federal funding, federal grants. That, that's this whole other area of question. And um, in the OMB and the federal agencies so several of them are really reminding grant recipients 
really, really, you need to have everything documented. And so, you know, it's just good protection. And, and I admit I'm an auditor. And so, you know, we love documentation, but um, yes, your decision process, your authorization, it, we really recommend documenting all that. That's great. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Judy's point about Bank of America uh, leads to kind of a question and comment to um, that she said they changed the eligibility requirements two days in and uh, removed the having a line of credit condition. Um, I, I mean, my comment is um, Columbia Bank, a smaller bank, was not ready with their application on day one that the loan was, was that the applications were, were available. Uh, yet, when they got set up, they seemed to be pretty responsive. Um, do, have you, do you have any insights on the big banks like Bank of America um, seems like it, they were open for business on day one, but had, and then they had to go back and change things because of the new guidance coming out. Um, we have a comment, BECU is always better. I guess that the high, whole idea is, should you look for a smaller bank or a larger established one like Bank of America that might be able to process more? Any guidance on that? I, well, Kristen, I think you gave the best advice. Start with the bank you have a relationship with um, because hopefully then, you know, you're already that far ahead of the game. I think what happened with some of the big banks, like this is just anecdotal. Um, I heard that Citibank was requiring uh, a lot of support to be able to even apply for the loan and requirements that I, I didn't see at any other bank. So I think what happened is the big banks, as you said, were better um, prepared to get everything launched. And they, did, they knew what was about to happen, this flood of applications. So they said, well, look, we're going to serve our current customers first and our current um, borrowing customers. And that was nowhere in the CARES Act. That was nowhere in the guidance from SBA. So I think they really were forced to backtrack on that. What I can tell you about Columbia Bank, what they shared with us is that they had a team of people. So the interim final rule came out on like a Thursday night. The applications were supposed to start Friday, April 3rd. Columbia Bank had a team of people working throughout the entire weekend and they opened their site Monday morning. So that would have been what, the sixth? And within the first 36 hours, they uh, accepted over 7,000 loan applications. So, you know, it, it, again, it's not a sales pitch and I'm sure a lot of banks are working really hard, but as frustrating as this is for everyone, the banks are, are really hopping, trying to, to be responsive to their customers. Yeah. So, um, so here's another question. It's pretty specific, but um, I think it, it, it's got uh, some other applications too. Um, and maybe this is more for Grant. In terms of the total payroll cost, um, there is a cap in the calculation for people making over 100,000 annually. So the question is, would it be more useful for an organization to reduce that person's pay to 100,000 to save money on official payroll? Or since the loan amount doesn't cover payroll for an employee over 100,000, does that not matter? I mean, that's interesting because I suppose that one of the things that's not addressed in that calculation, and there are a long laundry list of different scenarios where this could be manipulated or just confusing um, is, yeah, if you were capping that person at $100,000 and then you reduce their salary down to 100, does that even, does that go into your percentage reduction calculation? I don't think that the rules are specific enough to contemplate that. Um, this is the area where we're probably going to find the most guidance from the SBA going forward. I don't even know if I really have a 
intuitive response to that or strong gut feeling either way um, as to whether that would affect your percentage reduction or not. Um, that's probably a better question maybe for your bank who's probably going to be the uh, administering these loan forgiveness rules. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, I would keep an eye on publications from the SBA um, that clear up issues like these. There are, yeah, I guess I would just say there's no shortage of different scenarios similar to the one that you just posed um, where borrowers are trying to figure out how could we use this to our advantage or what's the best way to change our payroll structure. Um, to make sure that we're not having to reduce our loan forgiveness. I think there's going to be a lot of guidance in this area. Yeah. Um, and I, and so you're saying it could fall into that 25% reduction that you, you, for the loan forgiveness that you might get in trouble with. The other thing that's especially problematic about that section is it talks about the amount that you're paying to an employee for the covered period which is this eight week period after your loan starts. And then it references the payroll reduction and it says that you need to reference as your denominator, the amount that you paid the employee during the previous quarter before your covered period. Well, a quarter is usually 12 weeks and the covered period is eight weeks. So, you know, by the way the nature of the rule is currently drafted, you're at, you're already at 67% reduction. Um, so I think they're going to come out with, again, more rules that say <laughs> you're looking at probably not the entire quarter before, but the amount that you paid that same employee during the eight-week period um, before your covered period began. Huh. Yeah, I think I'm hoping there's more guidance on that because I think a lot of us either have thought about, you know, deferred salary or reduction of salary before. I mean, that's why we need the loan <laughs> and that we're having cash flow issues or if there's reduction in, in income. Um, so if we've already made adjustments before we get the loan, then then that's going to be problematic if it, if it goes into the calculation of loan forgiveness. Yep. And it's going to, I think, be difficult for a lot of businesses to try and rehire people quickly if they are trying to maximize their loan forgiveness. And since a lot of taxpayers don't know if they're going to get a loan right now, it's hard to make decisions going forward on who they can retain at a reduced payroll and who they might need to furlough. Right. Um, there's a couple of other questions. One's pretty specific. It says, can a sole proprietor LLC access the employee retention tax credit? Uh, I don't think so because I believe, and I'd have to look back into the rule, um, but I think that you that has to do with self-employment taxes then um, at the sole proprietor level and since you wouldn't be paying well okay never mind let me think um i guess if you were paying them not as an independent contractor but if you were a sole proprietor paying the payroll of another of one of your employees, um, then you might be eligible for the credit. Then I, I haven't thought I haven't contemplated that, so I'd need a little bit more time to think about that scenario. Um, but I think the important variable here is that it usually rely um, it revolves around self-employment taxes that are paid, which generally is only paid to one paid uh, for one person in the case of a sole proprietorship. Um, okay, but. yeah. Um, so most of the, the participants on this webinar are 501c3 nonprofits. So if you have not already applied for a PPP and you're in the process, what 
what do you think they should do? Do you think they should try to start the application process or look for some of those other opportunities that you mentioned at the beginning? Well, I, I would recommend that you do both. So um, I think especially for the PPP because of how quickly everything came out and because the rules kept changing and being further refined, I would say if you are in process or if you've thought about it, follow through because it does take a little bit of time to get all the information together. And what I've heard is that you make your additional application and then the bank comes back with some you know, clarifying questions. So I would say go ahead and do this because it's a little time consuming and then it's out of the way. At the same time, um, I think I would recommend that you do look at a couple of those other things that might be available to you, like the EEIG, the immediate $10,000 um, non-refundable um, advance or grant. I mean, that's essentially a grant because you get $10,000, you don't repay it. Um, and then if you are available for the employee retention credit, um, but also, you know, the payroll tax deferral, um, a couple organizations have said, well, why would I do that? I still need to submit the employer portion of the taxes. But the advantage of that would be it, it gives you a little cash flow at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say I would pursue everything that you might qualify for. Grant, do you have? Yeah, I would I would encourage the same thing. And even with like the EIDL loans, like there are provisions that allow you to refinance where like if you've pursued an EIDL loan because it seemed like the quickest way to get cash. Um, and then you subsequently receive a payroll protection loan. You're not allowed to have forgiveness under both of those. Um, but what happens is you can get it, the EIDL loan refinanced into the payroll protection program loan. So there are mechanisms to prevent uh, violating any of the rules if you do end up receiving two benefits. And Grant, so if you get, and just to clarify, if you get an EIDL loan, that is fully, re, you need to repay that at, I think for nonprofits, it's 2.75%. So that's a, a good rate. So you get an EIDL loan, and then if you are able to convert it to a PPP, well, then it becomes eligible to be forgiven, right? Yes. This, this is so great. We're coming to the end of our time and um, I'll ask both Grant and Debbie to maybe say some final words. And I just want to, you know, say as a nonprofit, this is, this is hard to go through this process in terms of um, probably more emotional than getting your paperwork ready because if you're, if you're applying, it means that, that you, you need this and that you get to a point where um, you know, when the funds run out, you've done all this work and it might be for nothing. And then we might have uh, more coming. Um, so it's, I, I, um, I understand how kind of emotional this is, especially for uh, those, the person responsible for applying and that, you know, it, it does make decisions um, that are pretty significant for the organization if you get the loan or not. Um, so, I understand that and I understand the emotion and the energy around that. So for those of you on the call, um, you know, I would, I would highly encourage you to keep going through the process. Again, I think um, find a bank, hopefully it's the bank you bank with that can work with you. Uh, keep going at it. My bank in particular said, please respond as fast as you can um, because it matters, time mat matters on this. So. Um, but, but keep at it. Um, again, if there are other topics that you want Global Washington to cover, we just heard there's new guidance coming out this all the time. So we might ask Grant and Debbie to come back in three weeks, three or four weeks um, to, to get more um, guidance on it. Um, you both have mentioned Lane Powell, who's also a Global Washington member that we're thrilled to have. And I've been in touch with them. They might be giving uh, another webinar if there's more specific topics that they can address. 
Um, so uh, hang in there, all of you, for fellow nonprofits. And um, uh, so, and then with that, Grant and Debbie, do you have any final words? Well, I mean, there are a lot of, <laughs> don't be too frustrated by the, the lack of guidance that we've gotten so far. There are a lot of people that are working, like I said, more guidance is released every day. So this really is a dynamic area. Um, and the fortunately, the interest rate's pretty low. So if you do end up in a situation where you, maybe you've gotten a loan that's a little bit larger than you were anticipating, um, the interest rate's pretty low. So you can pay that portion back under the PPP at 1%. Um, and hopefully that's not a huge hit to the organization if the forgiveness doesn't work out quite the way that you were originally anticipating if the facts aren't as favorable once we get more guidance. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, um, that you have a wonderful forum and partner in Global Washington, seriously. And um, I would just encourage you all to communicate through your partnership with Global Washington, share information, because as we keep saying, it's changing all the time. So really you all are probably the best source of information, your experiences, what you can share. Um, the other thing I would say is to reach out to your um, service partners, you know, whoever they are, your accountants, your um, legal counsel, um, you know, there are people who are really happy to answer questions to the best of our ability. So, um, you know, just keep in touch, try not to lose faith. Um, it's changing all the time and hopefully some new funding will become available very soon. So. Great. Yeah. And just briefly to add to that, uh, involve your board. This is, this is what your board is there. If you're the executive director, you should be talking to your board frequently about these issues and ask for their help, ask for their guidance. Um, they're, that's what they're there for. So, um, well, thank you all. And again, if there's follow-up questions, you can always email me or topics that you want to see in the future. Um, let me know. Again, Global Washington has a COVID-19 resource page where we're posting previous webinars and information. This slide deck will be posted there. Thank you so much, Debbie and Grant, for making that available. Um, and uh, we'll let you know about the next webinar coming up. Grant, Debbie, thank you so much. Uh, thank thank you, you all. Let's all persevere together. So thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.